Hi everyone, welcome to The Brew. This is episode 7 and as you know by now, The Brew is all about hearing people's highs and lows, their challenges in both their business and their personal life and what they've done to overcome it. Here at The Brew, we like to hear the stories because it helps motivate us through those terrible dark times that sometimes we face as small business owners. In episode 7, we hear from Kerry Chikarovsky and known to her friends and the public as Chika. Kerry was a long-standing leader of the opposition in the Liberal Party in New South Wales State Parliament. And as she says, while failure doesn't kill you, it can hurt a little bit. Here's some of her story. And with me in the studio after a spectacular flat white. (laughs) So it's not as easy being a barista as it looks. No, and that's why I have absolute faith in the people who make my coffee and don't want to get behind their uh, their machine and help them out. Okay, so we made a flat white. Yes. It didn't look as easy as you thought it was going to be. No. You did warn me that you weren't... You looked a bit apprehensive, actually. I've never seen you look apprehensive. <laughs> now I'm doing a post-analysis. Well, you need to come to my place for dinner when I'm cooking and I'll look a lot worse than that. <laughs> you don't cook? Not very often. I cook twice a year, really. Uh, and in this year it was only, will only be once. Because I do a Boxing Day lunch for yes, a whole lot of people. That's which is, the rumour. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for about 45 to 50 people. And normally I do a um, New Year's Eve dinner. This year, I, or last year past, I had a party. So we did uh, make your own pizzas. Much more my style. So we managed to get through a flat wire. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I said, you, you looked a little bit nervous. Mm-hmm. But you faced, surely, you faced much bigger challenges than making a flat wine, <laughs> even though you were standing next to someone who's taken two baristas to world championships. But, yeah. <laughs> so, Ange, my view of the world is it's specialisation of function. I know what I'm good at. Um, I'm, I'm more than confident to sit in your radio station and be interviewed by you. That, I'm completely relaxed. That's, that's fine, but making Absolutely. a flat white. But, you know, leave it to the experts. You were ready to convert to a long black. <laughs> yes, because I then wouldn't have had to have made the milk. Okay, so that, that says a lot. And that's why we do that. We like to see the level playing field yep. of, of what's going on. Yep. Now, y- you, you just mentioned that people should concentrate on what they're good at. Mm-hmm. But you've known or you knew maybe a lot sooner than other people, what your calling was, mm. which was civic public service yep. or, or being a politician, yep. which I struggle with that word sometimes because I don't think it actually describes the work mm. of an elected person. Yeah. Um, politics being a very different game to being a politician. So you were very young when you felt the calling. Yeah. Why? Uh, uh, look, I was 13. How? I was 13 when I made up my mind that I was going to be a politician. Um, I think it had a lot to do with the fact that I grew up in the States as a kid. I was there from the time I was seven to the time I was 13. Very political time in the States because I'm really old. Um, It was civil rights movement. I was there, you know, I met Bobby Kennedy. I was there when he was shot. I'm sorry, who? (laughs) <laughs> Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. As you do in your childhood, the the Bobby Kennedy. Yeah, yeah, no, I met Bobby Kennedy. I actually uh, shook his hand and my father had a conversation with him uh, when he was out on the campaign trail. He, um, he stopped because my father, he was walking through the crowd and my father shouted out, you know, Get, uh, good on you, mate. And in New York in the 60s, there weren't a lot of Australians. So he actually actually stopped and came over and talked to us. And I was introduced. This is my daughter, Kerry. And, you know, she's a big fan. And he shook my hand and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, that, I mean, it was just a whole lot lot of those sorts of things. You know, going to an international school where politics was really, even at a very young age, part of the the school. When you looked at, did he have that star quality? Did Bobby Kennedy (laughs) have that star quality? Well, it's interesting because if I close my eyes and, um, you know, I would have been... 12 at the time, I think. An I can impressionable actually, young lady. Yeah, I can still actually see him standing up um, on the platform where he was. And the thing that, if you know, if I, rem- I and I remember it so clearly, he wasn't a really smooth and polished speaker. He had a really kind of almost reedy voice, but there was just something about him. He had an aura about him. So, um, and I can't remember what he said because it was a very long time ago, but I absolutely, as I said, I can close my eyes and I can still see him standing on the steps. Um, at Long, at where we were at uh, Jones Beach on Long Island. So, you've been inspired as a young girl that politics is your future. But there's a, a family pedigree, though. Yeah, well, my father was involved. He was involved in local government, like you, crazy. I can't imagine yeah. why anyone's involved in local government. Me either. Very, very <laughs> thankless task. But he was also, as we called it then, general secretary of the Liberal Party. So I kind of grew up with little you know, politicians around. It was. 
it was not uncommon for my mother and father to entertain and have politicians at the table. So you've um, progressed through high school knowing or assuming that's where your calling mm-hmm. was going to be. You go to university, you become a lawyer. Yeah, well, I actually did law because I thought it would be useful as a politician. I thought it would help me understand process and all those sorts of things. And to be fair, it was actually quite good training. But reading yeah, reading ulti- a lot, going through a lot of paperwork. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. The but the best ultimate goal, ever. the ultimate goal was to be a politician. So um, I went and practiced law, but not for very long because it wasn't my cup of tea. I didn't want to be a lawyer, really. So uh, yeah, so I did that for a little while, and then um, I actually did some work for a contract work and was having a break and was going to you know, think about what I did next and I fell pregnant. So I was actually unemployed and pregnant, but at the stage married. So that was, <laughs> that was a good thing. We might thing. just backtrack there. <laughs> yeah, no, I was actually married. She got married. Yeah, no, I, did, I was married. And so um, I then just started doing what a lot of people my age were doing. I, you know, I worked from home. I had a small you know, family practice, if you like, looked after all my families and friends. Um, until Mark was about two, he's my younger one, and then I went back and taught at the College of Law. But it was still the ga- aim to be, you know, a politician. And one night I was at home and I was, I don't even know what was on TV, but something triggered it. I'm ironing the school uniforms for the week and I burst into tears. And my then husband looked at me and said, what's, you know, what's wrong with you? I'm 35 years old, all I've wanted to do is be a politician. And it hasn't happened. He said, well, what are you doing about it? So he said, you know, it's not going to just fall into your lap. So then I started to make some positive steps about doing it and uh, went and contacted the local member where I was in Lane Cove and said, you and I need to have lunch because I want your job. (laughs) And how did he take that? Um, Well, he'd actually... He made up his mind that he was going to retire. So, so you were aware of that. And it wasn't an, it wasn't imminent, though. He was going to retire kind of after the next election before the, the following one. So we, we worked out a, a plan. He said, look, you know, you need to do these things. You need to get better known. And that was all fantastic until um, he changed his time frame and he decided to resign from Parliament four days before Nick Griner called the election. And... Everyone knew that Nick was going to call the election on the Friday because it was before the fixed term. And John resigned on the Monday. And my father was frantically calling me during the day saying, um, John Dow's trying to find you. And I went, why? He said, because he's just announced his resignation. And I went, oh, this is about three and a half years too soon. So I was at home thinking, oh my God, you know, there go all my plans because I wanted to be in that seat because that's where I'd grown up. That's you know, where the kids Made were at sense. school. That's Made where sense. I lived, all that sort of stuff. So... Um, so Chris, my husband, walked through the door and said, have you nominated yet? And I went, well, don't we need to talk about it? He said, look, this is the seat you want. Go for it. So I did. And very fortunately, with the intervention of John Howard, the um, conference decided to have a proper pre-selection. So my pre-selection was held on the Sunday night with the election having been called on the Friday with no member and I think what was then the fourth safest Liberal Party seat. So I fronted a pre-selection, which no one thought I'd win because um, I was up against some pretty stiff opposition. And much to everybody's surprise, everybody's surprise, um, I won. <laughs> so it's your first taste of, of winning, yeah. unexpected. Yeah. Um, you're thrust into this world three and a half years earlier yeah. than the timetable exposed, yeah. but that's typical politics, right? You yeah. never know that's it. from one day to the next what's going to happen and where you might find yourself for whatever reason. You go through an election yep. and you win. Was Parliament everything you thought it would be? Do you know the really, really overwhelming sensation, which again I can still remember today, is walking in and sitting down on those green benches and going, this is where I always wanted to be and I'm so excited I'm here. And it was, look, I mean, it was 12 years. It was, we can talk about... It feels like home, right? It feels like home. But it was, you know, it was 12 years of highs and lows, but I would not, not, not have done it. I mean, it was just the most amazing thing to have done. You know, politicians in general stand for something mm-hmm. and want to achieve something mm-hmm. great and, and make a difference somewhere. And it, it, they're all noble causes because you know, you're one of those few people that is a, a shining light of, of the good that is in, in this political arena. There's so much good there and it often yeah. doesn't get a light shined on it. The, the decades that people spend, mm. you know, working hard and, and I think one of the great aspects of, of your career too has been family... Um, the cost of, of 
being able to concentrate on a full-time career and yep. trying to raise kids at the same time. And, and as you've pointed out in so many other media interviews, people always asking you, how do you juggle motherhood and politics? <laughs> and, you, you know, how did you? Because it's not easy. Um, well, I don't know that I was particularly successful at um, doing it all anyway. Um, look, I think it's fair to say that, you know, my marriage... It, 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 it wasn't just because of the politics, but being a politician didn't help in terms of, you know, I think if you ask my ex-husband, he'll tell you that I was a good mum. I was there for the kids. Uh, but was I a good wife? Probably not. Probably didn't spend enough time being, you know, being in that role with him. So, But your time's not your own anymore. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And I mean, and I must say that second time round, I learned to manage it better as a minister, because I became a minister after 12 months. And like I was... Thrust, thrust again into that world, yeah. Yeah, and the, the, what happens is, you know, you. I mean, I absolutely remember the moment that I realised that I needed to actually get a little bit more balance in my life. I walked in one night. I must have been minister for probably about six or eight months. I walked in one night. Lisa came rushing up to me, and Lisa would have been about nine, perhaps, came rushing up to me to give me a cuddle because she heard the door open. And I walked in with a whole stack of red files, which were, you know, all the ministerial correspondence I had to deal with. And she got up and she went, Mummy! And she stopped and she said, you're not going to work at home, are you? And I realised then that I had to actually get some better balance. So it's an, in, it's an intense environment and you're trying to make sure that you do the right thing by the family. Um, maybe not necessarily as a wife, but certainly as a as mum. A and then dealing with a world of, of politics and, and people who aren't always meaning what they're saying. So, <laughs> obviously, you were betrayed. Well, was I betrayed? I think, um, I think it's fair to say that, uh, did I see it coming? Uh, the answer probably is not. But, so I don't know betrayed. I think politics, I think that's an unfortunate word because in politics, you know, I'd, I'd um, take it over from Peter Collins. He, he would absolutely tell you that he'd been betrayed. I just think that it's, you know, thrust of politics and... I was, I was disappointed because I actually thought we were heading in the right direction and I thought, the, I thought that if they'd left it till after the next election, then it would have been a clean and much easier transfer. But so, anyway, so I'd what's already it, given the commitment that if I hadn't won the election, I was going to have You were going to leave that. anyway. Yeah. But what's it take to win then? So I suppose the difference between politics and most other businesses or professions is that in politics there's probably less in your control than there is in other politics, in other professions. So from my perspective, for example, I mean, I had a terrible, terrible run with certain sections of the media who just wanted to get rid of me because I have no doubt they didn't think a woman could do it. I have no doubt. I mean, I had one experience where um, I went down to a press conference and to this day I can't tell you what the topic was. But it was the most horrendous thing that has ever happened to me. I was there for 35 minutes. My my media advisor was in the back. She was in tears because of what they were doing to me. It was just horrific, right? You know, and and I walked out thinking, what on what on earth have I done to deserve this, right? Anyway, I went upstairs and I think I kept it all together. They didn't they didn't get me. And I thought I did a pretty good job. But anyway, walked out, went upstairs, walked into my office, and my my receptionist came in and said one of these uh, media girls wants to come up and see you and I'm like, oh my god what else can they do to me anyway this lovely woman who worked for one of the um, FM radio stations she came up and she said look can I just talk to you privately and she shut the door and went, what's going on she said look I feel really bad she said I should have warned you about that I said what do you mean warned me about that she said those and there were three blokes had sat in the um, in the conference area for the press for the um, you know where the press were down in their kind of coffee area and had plotted how they were going to make you cry because they wanted to write the headline, she's not up to it, you know, Chikorovsky cracks, can't cope with the pressure. She said, they are so pissed off that you didn't. You didn't, you didn't deliver. <laughs> I, I didn't deliver a tear. She said, they are ropeable. So how much do you think has changed there? Look, I think it's there for all politicians, to yeah. be honest. Um, I think the, the easy, I mean, it just, you know, cracks me up in many ways because... You know, women in Parliament, if they cry, aren't coping with the pressure. Men in Parliament, when they cry, it's because they're in touch with their feminine side. You know, I think there's still an element of it there. And I'll go. I mean, if you ask, you know, look at what happened to Julia, you know, Gillard, then I think you know, there is still an element of it there. But I do think it's. I think it's fair game on all politicians these days. And I 
honestly wouldn't want to be there now because the the media intrusion these days is so much more because everybody's a reporter. Yeah. Everybody's the, the got social, a camera. The social media intrusion yeah. is... Yeah, you know, it, everybody can, can take a photo and put it on Twitter. And I mean, they would have... Hi everyone, sorry to interrupt and just jump in here quite randomly. We're taking a quick break just to make sure that we let you know. Like us on Facebook, The Brew. Check out our videos with our brew guests making their favourite coffee behind the machine or at least trying to. And don't forget to subscribe and review us on iTunes and tell your friends. The Brew. We might make some time and get back to our guest. Um, And... I know you've 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 said there was similar lines of, of what Julie Gillard had once said that you know she doesn't get up in the morning focusing on what's going on behind her back she just yeah, looks ahead and, and that's what you said too you know I don't yeah. focus on who might stab me in the back or you've got agree a job with to me do, today you've just got to get on with that's it that's right you can't rely on that and that's what small business does we yep. just try to move forward in yep. spite of everything yep. but it's not easy being leader of the opposition one day and <laughs> not the next no. so you've had the rug completely pulled out of you from under you what happens then well the immediate reaction was um those sunday night dinners i had with my children i actually took them to a sunday night dinner and just before i left i looked at my diary and my diary had basically been in 15 minute increments and there was nothing in it there was not a meeting there was not a, a breakfast schedule nothing in it so I got to the restaurant and um, sat down and was looking at the menu and started sobbing uncontrollably. I just couldn't stop. And my two children are like incredibly embarrassed because here we are in the middle of Crow's Nest at a restaurant we go to all the time and there's their mother bawling her eyes out. And you know, Lisa said, what's wrong? And I said, look, I've wanted to do this all my life and now there's no, there's no path forward for me. I've, you know, I've been leader of the opposition, I can't do it. And I said, it's been my passion. And she just looked at me and she said, well, why don't you find something else that you can be passionate about? And it was good advice. Um, I had made up my mind that I wasn't going to walk out because we were 12 months out from an election and I wouldn't do that to the Liberal Party. And then there was a bit of a campaign by people internally to um, to push me out. And because they didn't think, you were, you were breaking the mould by, by having a very fair attitude to this. Oh, yeah. Okay, was, it's happened, now yeah. I want to still help because you've, you're very much a member yeah. of the Liberal Party. And, you know, I'm very grateful to the Liberal Party for the opportunities yeah. it gave me. But yes, I was actually very much, you know, being, I was in the shadow cabinet, I was being part of the team, all that sort of stuff. Anyway, so when this campaign started, I went away for a week and I literally sat on a balcony overlooking the water for a week on my own, no kids, no one. And did lists, why should I go, why should I stay? And in the end, I decided there were more reasons to go than to stay. One of which was I was, you know, 48 or something and I could get an, have another career. Um, but it was a really hard decision because, you know, 13, 48, long time in my life that yeah. I'd wanted to do this. But um, I And you went, came so close yeah, to being Premier. You came yeah, so close. Yeah. So, uh, so in the end, I decided to go. And it's not a decision I regret because... It was on my terms. It was me deciding I wanted to go. So you're going to, and ra- I know they were trying to push me out in some ways, but it, you know I could have resisted that. But I just decided, look, I don't want to be the focus of everyone's um, angst from here on in because I knew a, a little bit like other former leaders who were still sitting in Parliament. Yes, yeah, so I was going to draw a parallel uh, yeah. comparison. Well, every time someone something would yeah. go wrong, if there was a leak or something, I would get blamed, and yeah. I went, well, that's not fair. And also, I would have been a distraction because I can tell you the number of my colleagues said he'll. You know, John won't be able to cut this. You should stay and take over. And I went, mm, no, I don't think I'm going to hang around for that. So I left. And I walked out with nothing to do. I didn't have a job. That was scary. And that's that's the next phase of, yeah. of, of your life. Yeah. So you're now a lobbyist. Yeah. What is that? So what happened was I, um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I literally walked out without a job. And everyone told me, I loved it. I talked to a whole lot of recruiters and they said, go away, have six months overseas, think about what you'll do and we'll come back and talk to us when you come back. And I went, that's great. I've got a son doing the HSC. That's not going to happen. Mm. So um, I basically what happened was people started coming to me and saying, look, can you help out? Because we need to work with... And in large measure, it's working with the bureaucracy. We don't know who to go to. We don't know... And so what happened was I started just helping out some friends. And then um, one of my friends said, what do I owe you? And he went, no, 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 I'll pay you. And I went, oh, maybe I can make a business out of this. So that's what I did. I actually then... uh, And 
Chikorovsky and Associates, Associates is born. Yep, set up and I've been doing that now for a number of years, pretty well since I left Parliament. And again, most of it is working with the bureaucracy and helping people get through the, the bureaucracy, both here um, at state level. I do a, a lot more policy stuff with people at federal level. You know, the bureaucrats and I love them dearly, but they talk, they talk a different language. They have a different approach. And small business in particular gets incredibly frustrated because it's, it's often cumbersome and it's often very slow. We're, we feel like we're continuously ripped off and not heard. Yeah. Um, and, and we're not the only group to feel like that. I mean, almost everyone with a gripe is going to say the same thing. Yeah. And the problem is that uh, my personal political philosophy is that it's not up to governments to fix every problem but it is up to government to get out of the way and let you get on with your business and fix your own problems. You've got that background and you've seen firsthand what yeah. that level of red tape oh, can do. It and, just, and it's incredibly frustrating. It strangles. Yeah, it strangles it's incredibly businesses. frustrating. So I think the, you know, an approach from government which says we need less laws, not more, we need less regs, not more, is that it sits with me philosophically. You've also been um, known to say that... Um, Failure does hurt, sure. but it doesn't kill you. Absolutely right. So most people fear failure um, on, on many different levels, you know, scared of, of not doing what they want to do or, or scared of being stuck or scared of trying something and then losing, not winning. All of these things add mm. up to failure in people's minds. And when it comes face to face, when you're actually looking at failure and you're wallowing in it or experiencing it, it's suddenly not such a big deal anymore. Yeah, and look, you know, regret is a much worse feeling than uh, having to bitter. face up to failure. Um, and I suppose my best example of that was when they did come and tell me that I had to go. So they said to me, you are going to be really embarrassed when you lose. At which stage I told them to F off out of my office um, and, you know, and sent them packing. But I got home that night and I told the kids what was going on and I'm lying in bed and staring at the ceiling and thinking about everything I'd done and more importantly, you know, what what I should do about this elect this vote that was going to take place in a few days time and I thought to myself you know will I really be embarrassed um, and I you know contemplated that and in the end I decided embarrassment was one thing regret was a, would be something much much worse and I thought if I actually don't put my hand up I will never know whether I could have won and you know that would have killed me Going through the rest of my life saying, oh, I should have had a go, I should have had a go, and not would have killed me. So I... Uh, e eventually you come to that. Yeah, and, but yeah. I mean, that's why, look, you know, if you have a go and if you fail, what's it going to do? Well, I mean, I lost by one. Not that I'm bitter and twisted. No, I lost by one. No. But, I, but, you know, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have known how close it was. Yeah. I wouldn't have known how much support I had from my colleagues, all those sorts of things. So at the end of the day, failure will not kill you. You don't want to do it. It is character building, but as I've said to other people, I've had enough character building for yeah. my life. I don't personal, need any more. Good personal development. Yeah, but it's 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 not trying that is far worse than failing. So, from the perspective of um, you've had a few years out of parliament now, mm -hmm. has politics changed? Oh, look, I think it's I think it's nastier now than yeah. when I was there. I, I, mean, I we, would agree with you, but then you know yeah. what do I know? <laughs> but well, I mean, when I was there, it used to always be called the bear pit, and I don't know about the state parliament because you don't see as much of that on TV, for example, and I don't get the feeling that that's gotten too much worse. But certainly, federal parliament is, you know, the uh, and, and I've got look, I've got a view of the world which is that um, people elect politicians because they want them to improve our country, right? They improve the nation, and I think that working together can actually do, do that. You can actually deliver outcomes. I understand that you know, political philosophies can be at odds with each other, mm. but there must be more that these guys can actually And it can't on. be the reason to not do something. Yeah. It, it's, you know, uh, I mean, how Point. far apart are we? Well, I mean, you know, it, it shouldn't be about point scoring. No, and, but but I mean, I know, question time even in our day, and it yeah. still is now, question time is all about the gotcha moment, you know, making people look stupid as they stand up to answer a question. Um, in the parliament, that's what the opposition's trying to do. So, and do you th do you think now, being a lobbyist, do you think that's presented you with a different perspective again of the world? Would that would that change you as a politician if you did it um, again? Probably, no, probably not as a lobbyist, um, but perhaps. And and, I, and look, I think my life experience um, now would actually mean that maybe I'd be a better politician now than when I first went in because I do have more life experience because I'm so old. Um, no. <laughs> But I think, look, I actually thought... It has to be some advantage to longevity, Terry. 
But I do actually think that I brought a perspective to the parliament which was right for the times because, you know, there weren't a lot of women in the joint, so I think that was right. I was a young mum. There There's still a lot not a lot of women in the joint. I know, I know. Um, and it's even harder for young mums now. The expectation yeah. of what kids are meant to yeah. do is... Yeah. You, you have to be able to cut yourself up into three. Yeah, and it's... And although I do encourage, I constantly encourage you know, women to think about a political career because it's one of the few careers where you can genuinely say, I'm here because I'm doing things for people. Yeah. See, I mean, I was never going to be a doctor because I can't stand blood. I wasn't much good at social work because I thought, you know, I don't know if I can cope with listening to people's problems all the time. But being a politician gave me the opportunity to really make a difference to people's lives. And, people and then, but without realising it, you were getting into a war that was blood and guts. Yeah. Well, no, no. I had and a you are good, listening to people's problems. Yeah. And, but I had, a, I had a pretty good idea of what I was looking, letting yeah. myself in for in that respect. But, you know, I knew that if I... And one of the things I actually pride myself on was that I actually developed pretty good relationships with the bureaucrats who had man you know, who had to look after things in my electorate. So we had good relationships with the housing department. We had good relationships with North Shore Hospital. So people who had issues with, you know, with those sorts of things, I had very good relationships with the principals of all my schools. So I could pick up the phone to a principal. You know, we had, we had a group of Afghani women who'd had the courage to leave their abusive husbands. And we used to look after them because they didn't speak any English. They'd have their kids ring. And, you know, I remember on one occasion, one of the little boys rang and said, my mum my mum would like me to read you this note because she didn't know, she couldn't read English. Yeah. And the note was that there was a parent-teacher, you know, day, whatever it was in the future. And she was absolutely terrified of going to the school because, you know, Afghani women who didn't have any education didn't go to schools. So I rang the principal and I said, because I knew she took her kids to the school Which gate. Which school, yeah. yeah. School gate every morning. And I rang him and I said, tomorrow morning, can you stop and say hello to her and say we're really looking forward to you coming to parent teacher day or night or whatever it was with your children um, because she didn't know what to do she didn't know what it meant so just little things like that and in fact when I left parliament I had a phone call from my electorate secretary who was blubbering away on the phone because you know it announced I was leaving and all that sort of stuff and she'd been pretty good about it all but she said I've had a phone call from one of those women and I said, oh yeah, and, she said, and they used to call me the big lady because they couldn't pronounce Chukarovsky. So, so the phone call was from this woman who didn't speak a lot of English. If the big lady's going, who's going to look after us? And I kind of, when she told me, I burst into tears because to me that was what it was all about. Yeah. It was helping people. So thank you. Oh, um, my pleasure. For our listeners out there, again, failure won't kill you. I think the I, learn. I think it was and I may be wrong but I think they quote Thomas Edison tried how many times I can't remember he tried to make a light bulb you know a hundred times or 98 times and he finally got it right on the hundredth and that's because he didn't give up and you don't give up you just keep going if it's easy to say though it's no, easy it, to say if, you, if you've got something that you're really passionate about and I often say this when I'm talking to young people I mean the you know, there's a really corny card which says, aim for the stars, you'll at least make the moon, or you might make the moon. And I think that's right. You have to aim as high as you possibly can, because even if you don't get there, at least you'll have tried and you'll know you've given it your best. I mean, I had some bloke come up to me after I said that at a, um, <laughs> at a I don't know, some talk I was giving. He said, yeah, I don't know how you can say that, because you are a complete failure. And I looked at him and I went, so tell me, when were you leader of the opposition? Mm. Tell me, when were you in parliament? Tell me, what have you achieved in your life? Don't tell me I failed. I mightn't have become premier, which is what I wanted to do, but I swear to God, I had a lot more, you know, happen in my life than I suspect you might have had in yours. There's, a, there's slinked, a slightly different path. Slinked, slinked, slinked away, away he? he did. He slinked away. And on that note. Thanks, Chica, for sharing your story with us here at The Brew. I learned a lot today and it, it, it gave me comfort and motivation.